This is the Human Action Podcast with your host, Jeff Deist. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It is the Human Action Podcast. Bob Murphy's not with us today. He's off doing whatever Bob Murphy does all day. But we have Daniel McCarthy with us as our guest. I'm sure many of you know him. Daniel is VP up at ISI, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, also edits Modern Age Journal, which if you're a little tired of all the fast food diet in your email inbox uh, or in your physical mailbox, I really suggest Modern Age. It's a, it's a fantastic erudite read. So it's great to see you, Daniel. It's good to join you, Jeff. Well, so Daniel is fresh off a couple of appearances. First of all, at the big National Conservatism Conference down in Miami recently, and just before that, he was actually our keynote speaker at the Libertarian Scholars Conference, which we held a couple of weekends back in Nashville. And I'm going to read the title of his talk there, to which we will provide a link on YouTube. It's, it's uh, Misunderstandings, Legitimate Differences, and Prospects for Harmony Between Libertarians and Conservatives Today. So that's quite a mouthful, Daniel. It was, uh, it was an interesting talk, but... I guess coming off of this conference in Miami, which uh, our own Tho Bishop attended as well, can you give us, you know, give us your take? What's the state of modern conservatism in the U.S. these days? Well, conservatism got taken over completely by neoconservatism back uh, about 20 years ago. So uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, there had been a bit of a civil war on the American right between the neoconservatives who often were willing to make peace with the uh, a rather extensive welfare state and uh, a much more extensive warfare state. The neoconservatives uh, in the 1990s became the uh, most outspoken advocates of a kind of democratic empire. And they wanted to have, engage in nation building all around the world, but especially in the Middle East. And when George W. Bush became president, the neoconservative agenda went ahead full steam. And basically any conservative in the early 2000s who was critical of the neoconservative agenda, especially in foreign policy, wound up getting kicked out of the movement. And so uh, you had a creation of new institutions like the American Conservative Magazine that were critical of the neocons. You had uh, some new alliances forged and uh, some old alliances like the ones between paleoconservatives like Pat Buchanan and uh, Ron Paul libertarians, uh, Murray Rothbard libertarians. Some of those alliances that had been uh, sort of in operation in the 1990s came back into force to some degree in the 2000s. And I think you saw that with both of Ron Paul's uh, presidential campaigns in 08 and 2012. Well, the neocons were already losing their grip, as you could see in 2008 and 2012 with Ron Paul's successful insurgencies in the Republican presidential primaries in those years. That Ron Paul was a much bigger phenomenon than any of the neocons accounted on. And then in 2016, Donald Trump was able to capitalize on the grassroots discontent and just the, the sheer sort of shame that uh, many conservatives felt about where they had been led into by the neoconservatives. And Donald Trump, of course, was not someone who had a sort of philosophically fully developed uh, uh, worldview. He was not, you know, a Pat Buchanan paleoconservative. He's obviously not a Murray Rothbard, an anarcho-libertarian or anything. But Donald Trump had many sound instincts and um, he was able to kind of free conservatism from the cul-de-sac into which the neocons had led it. And so as a result, now in the post-Trump era, there's a lot of fresh questioning among conservatives of various types about what it means to be conservative and uh, what kinds of you know, you know, uh, frontline issues uh, the right has to face today, whether it's wokeism, whether it's the COVID lockdowns, whether it's uh, the possibility of World War III between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, all of these issues are demanding that conservatives think anew, especially relative to what they had taken for granted back in the 2000s, when really you know, the neocon agenda was uh, almost unchallenged. And at this point, you know, there's a chance for some real new fresh thinking. Is there any kind of definable doctrine? Can you define national conservatism after this conference? Well, I'll say two things. You know, uh, so Yoram Hazoni, who organizes the National Conservatism Conference, has written two books, uh, one of which is on nationalism. Actually, he's written several books, but the two uh, most important recent books, one is called The Virtue of Nationalism that was released about three or four years ago. And that's a book about nationalism, of course. And then most recently, he's uh, published a book called Conservatism, A Rediscovery. And Hazoni has a particular formulation of conservatism, which um, you know, strongly draws upon uh, a Protestant tradition in Anglo-American history, and also comes from uh, Hazoni's own outlook as an Orthodox Jew. 
So it's a form of conservatism that, that in his case places a great deal of emphasis on the Bible, on revealed religion, uh, but also upon the nation state. And Hazoni has a brilliant chapter at the end of his book on nationalism, where he basically says that at the end of World War II, there were two different approaches to nationalism, one taken by Israel, the other by the European Union. The European Union basically said nationalism is always a bad thing. We should try to transcend nationalism, have a you know continental-wide super government, and ultimately that mentality leads towards a world government and the kind of global you know governance institutions that we've seen developing over the last 25 or 30 years. Whereas the other approach, the one taken by the Israelis, was to say we need to actually create a nation state of our own in order to protect our people. And so Hazoni thinks that if Israel is to survive as a nation state, you have to have the principle of nationalism defended all across the board, including uh, in the West. And this makes Hazoni quite different from some of the neocons of the early 2000s, who were basically imperialists as opposed to nationalists of any kind. And when we think of Jewish voters in the U.S., yes, there are neoconservatives, but a lot of Jewish voters are left progressives. I, it just seems like they would be uncomfortable with Hazoni and, and his uh, doctrine because they're not particularly on board with the idea of uh, uh, Christianity influencing governance. I think that's right. And, you know, Hazoni's worked very hard to uh, include, you know, Christian conservatives of many different denominations. So uh, there's a, a strong parallel between Hazoni's own thought and certain kinds of Protestant thinking within the British and American traditions. But he's also made sure to include as wide a you know constellation of Catholic thinkers as possible in his conference. So while Hazoni's mm. particular view of national conservatism is very well defined and articulated, uh, the national conservatism conference that he puts on tends to be rather more ecumenical. And so you have somewhat uh, different variations on these themes from uh, Catholic conservatives and Protestant conservatives. And you have, you know, just a variety of different emphases. Uh, some people are focused more on issues like trade and on foreign policy, and others are focusing on some of the culture war issues. But that's what actually makes the National Conservatism Conference quite an attractive thing and a lot of fun to attend, precisely because you're getting people from different camps, all of whom are quite outspoken. They're not like, you know, back in the old days of the neocons where people tended to um, kind of watch what they say in case they offend people. At the NatCon conference, you actually have folks who are pretty outspoken. Uh, I was on a panel with Paul Gottfried, for example, who, of course, mm -hmm. uh, is never uh, one to self-censor. And uh, that was great fun. And I think, um, you know, it was really good to see the response that different uh, camps of conservatives had to one another. And also, I mean, they had some interesting discussions of libertarianism as well. So on the panel that I and Paul Gottfried were on, we also had Eugene Meyer, who is the son of Frank Meyer, who is, of course, the sort of great libertarian thinker, the fusionist thinker at National Review in the, um, you know, sort of uh, 50s and 60s. And also uh, Jason Jewell, who I know has done a lot of work with the Mises Institute. And uh, Jewell, you know, is someone who has a strong background in free market economics, but is also a great admirer of Russell Kirk. And so we had an interesting talk from Jewell about Kirk and free market thought. Well, it is an interesting period, I think. Are you at all surprised? Maybe Trump caused this. Maybe this is a symptom of Trump. But we've got all this realignment going on. The old uh, boundaries between, let's say, National Review and the Claremont Institute and the West Coast Straussians and the Chronicles types. Uh, and we even see a realignment happening at the Heritage Foundation. I mean, it, there, there's a lot of movement here. Uh, and then you mentioned Catholic thinkers like Patrick Deneen. It seems like there's something is trying to coalesce, but I'm not certain that it, it is or what it is. Well, you know, back in the 1990s, there were, you know, not exactly the same camps of conservatives and libertarians in discussion, but uh, some of them were out there. So in the 1990s, you know, you had this great creative moment when a lot of paleoconservative intellectuals, uh, people like uh, Paul Gottfried, for example, uh, Thomas Fleming, one, another one of the writers associated with Chronicles, they took a, a new interest in the work of people like Murray Rothbard and what some of the you know, sort of most cutting edge uh, radical libertarians were doing in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So you had a meeting of minds, not trying to come up with you know, some sort of composite ideology or anything like that, but rather a, a gathering of friendship and knowledge sharing that happened in the early 1990s. Um, and it tended to be sort of clustered around uh, practical support for Pat Buchanan and practical uh, opposition to the Persian Gulf War in 1991 and to basically what were already uh, apparent as the over the horizon foreign policy misadventures that the neocons were going to get us into. So you had the beginnings of a moment kind of similar to this back in the early 1990s. But I think two or three things caused that moment to be kind of stillborn. Uh, one of them was that uh, the establishment just got very lucky and that you had so much technological prosperity in the late 1990s, 
uh, you know, and the Federal Reserve was printing money. There was this sense of a sort of endless horizon of prosperity and also of national security, which seemed to give the neocons a blank check to do whatever they wanted. They could have, you know, sort of compassionate conservatism, expanding government at home, and they could also engage in all kinds of nation building escapades around the globe. And so those conservatives and libertarians who were critical of this project uh, were sidelined. And, you know, we were, we were all cast as being uh, sort of doom and gloomers. And uh, uh, I think it was Virginia Postrel from Reason Magazine who claimed that uh, all of us were opposed to dynamism, that dynamism was the, you know, sort of wave of the future. And this, this coincided with, you know, Francis Fukuyama's end of history and things like that. Uh, and of course, what we've seen is that actually all of these um, hopes that people had in the late 1990s about this endless horizon of liberalization around the globe uh, turned out to be a false hope. It turned out to be a, a sort of a fever dream. And we've seen, you know, since then that uh, the People's Republic of China has not, you know, liberalized, uh, certainly not in the way that had been imagined back then. We've seen that in our own country, uh, political correctness has actually taken on, you know, an even more hardline form. And uh, some of the successful anti-crime measures that were adopted back in the 1990s have now been scaled back uh, as a result of woke protests and demands that uh, criminals basically be allowed to um, evade um, you know, arrest and, uh, and resist arrest. So uh, I, th I think what we're seeing right now is a reawakening of some of the tendencies that had started to be uh, discussed back in the early 1990s, but then were lost because of really an, a historical accident of this kind of peace dividend we got in the late 1990s. It didn't last long because, of course, the neocons took us away from a policy of peace. And then, of course, we had 911. 9-11, uh, I think, was a huge gift for the interventionists and the neocon wing. Uh, that's what made W and Ashcroft and Rumsfeld and John Yu and uh, Wolfowitz and all those people, uh, Dick Cheney, that's what made them what they are, 9-11. And, of course, the tragic irony of this is that 9-11 was precisely the outcome of many of the policies that we had been pursuing uh, for over a decade. So, I mean, you can actually, and I think there's a great essay to be written at some point on this topic, but you can go back and look at the whole sequence of new terrorist attacks upon the United States that start happening after the Persian Gulf War. And it's pretty clear that the Persian Gulf War serves as an inspiration for a lot of the renewed terrorist attacks on the United States in the 1990s. So think of things like the first uh, World Trade Center bombing, mm -hmm. for example, uh, back in 1993. And there are a number of other incidents as well, which basically show that um, you know, uh, that a hornet's nest has been stirred up and is now coming after the United States. And obviously, it's not the case that Islamist radicals were pro-American or, you know, indifferent to the United States before the Persian Gulf War. But the Persian Gulf War really uh, brought home the idea that there was this single global struggle. And suddenly all of these jihadists wanted to be involved in a struggle against uh, the United States. And, uh, you know, the American policy in many cases had actually amplified and strengthened some of these uh, Islamist elements. And our relationship with Saudi Arabia played into this as well, because what Saudi Arabia was doing throughout the 80s and 90s and beyond was uh, financing, you know, some of the most radical mosques all around the world. When when you have these radical mosques preaching this very strong, you know, violent ideology and anti-Americanism, uh, you can't be surprised when suddenly people start taking that message seriously and using it as a uh, you know rationale to carry out attacks against civilians, which we saw so much of not only on 9/11 and before, but also since then with subsequent waves of Islamist radicalism. Well, 9-11 is an absolute tragedy, I think, in terms of our response to it. Uh, does Ron Paul get any credit for this uh, new non-interventionist sentiment that seems to be uh, emerging on the new right? I think he gets some. You know, Michael Anton at the most recent uh, National Conservatism Conference um, took the time to praise libertarians and to recognize them, recognize especially, I think, the Ron Paul wing of libertarians as having been correct in their, you know, uh, analysis of our foreign policy. So I think there is a growing awareness among uh, conservatives that Ron Paul was, you know, prophetic. And uh, mm -hmm. certainly those who know, um, you know, both the intellectual tendencies and also the political patterns in uh, the Republican Party can recognize that there is a connection between what Ron Paul was saying in 2008 and 2012 and the very successful message that uh, Donald Trump had in 2016. So what is, if you could summarize for us, what is the uh, national conservative critique of market liberalism or free markets? Yeah, I think part of it is the idea that, um, 
you know, obviously a lot of uh, more establishment libertarians wind up having a uh, almost utilitarian view of life and they see uh, economic efficiency as being the be-all and end-all of human action. And this is something that, uh, you know, national conservatives who have a strong religious sensibility find to be morally false. Uh, so there's that level of critique at the very, you know, sort of uh, core of what human objectives are. Beyond that, uh, I think that you have a number of national conservatives who, uh, you know, are um, either concerned about the plight of America's working class and the Rust Belt, or who uh, look at sort of globalist uh, initiatives in, um, uh, you know, trade policy or in creating, uh, you know, sort of transnational forms of government and regulatory agencies, and who see a, an assault on sovereignty, basically, coming mm -hmm. from these kinds of transnational agreements. And uh, there are also a number of national conservatives who are very concerned about China, um, some of whom see China as a challenge, you know, on the economic and ideological spheres, and some of whom see China uh, as a challenge in the military sphere as well. And I think there are some significant gradations of um, opinion and analysis among national conservatives about whether China should be seen primarily as a military matter or as an economic and uh, political one. And uh, at last year's National Conservatism Conference in 2021, there was actually a pretty heated exchange between uh, Michael Anton and David Goldman on the one side, who saw China primarily as an economic threat and it's something okay. that we shouldn't look at chiefly in military terms. And Michael Pillsbury, who is very, very much on the side of seeing China as a threat that needs to be countered in military uh, ways. But in this emerging right, there is a sense that libertarian market dogma somehow took over conservatism. I've heard people like Steve Bannon voice this. Uh, but I just want to clarify, this is not strictly an economic critique. In other words, uh, getting rid of steel tariffs cost us a bunch of jobs in Pittsburgh or something like that. It's broader. It's, it's cultural. It's broader. It's cultural. And, you know, it also ties into something like immigration, where I think it's fair to say that, uh, you know, national conservatives are quite strongly on the side of immigration restrictionism, whereas uh, especially among, you know, sort of libertarians in the academic establishment, uh, they tend to be outright open borders advocates. And so uh, there's a, a sharp difference there between sort of the official libertarian movement and national conservatives on this question of whether you can have open borders and what those borders, open borders would mean for, uh, you know, a country politically and uh, simply in terms of its cohesion and solvency as a, you know, sort of cultural as well as political unit. I guess as an aside, do you think that uh, many uh, the kind of people who would be at this conference or have an interest in this movement have considered Hoppe at all? I think his name is probably not well known and his works are probably not well known. But if they were, I think there would be several points of agreement as well as some fundamental disagreements. Um, you know, Hoppe is uh, often portrayed as being a kind of nationalist monarchist or something like that. Whereas, in fact, Hoppe believes in private property anarchy. So Hoppe is very culturally uh, on the right, but he also is someone who has a very strong libertarian view of a totally private system. Whereas uh, the national conservatives at the conference, uh, they are not so much, uh, you know, uh, optimistic about the idea that you could have totally private governance. They instead, you know, tend to be more um, adherent to the existing sort of uh, nation state, at least as a concept. Do you think this movement views ideology itself? as something that's perhaps too rigid and something to be discarded. We don't need to be slaves uh, to ideology. We need to uh, uh, you know, view the world in a little bit more hard-boiled manner, a little more ad hoc manner, and, and do what works as opposed to being, you know, tying ourselves into knots because of what some economists wrote in the 1800s. I think that's right. There is a sense that, um, you know, um, Joram Hazoni in his recent book, uh, Conservatism, A Rediscovery, is actually quite critical of some of the conservatives who have gone before him, who he thinks, you know, have uh, perhaps focused too much on literary or historical matters. Um, Hazoni has a few chapters in his book on history. He does try to create his, his own sort of version of conservative history. But in general, he does want to focus on more practical and contemporary applications, as opposed to, uh, you know, having more of a, a vision of an enchanted past. And, you know, I mean, I can see... Um, some of the strengths and weaknesses in Hazoni's position, and I think you'll actually find among the national conservatives at his conferences, that there is a broad spectrum of points of view. So some people will have a kind of Kirkian aversion to the idea of ideology and to a very strict, you know, sort of uh, principle-based approach to politics. They will see politics 
as more a matter of prudence and of good judgment and of following you know, the intimations of tradition rather than a checklist of uh, policy priorities. And then there are others who want to be much more sort of agenda-driven and policy-driven. And then there are still others, and I think this alludes to what you were saying, who want to have you know, a realistic approach, uh, but perhaps one that's not quite as much uh, following tradition as Russell Kirk might have preferred, but instead is based upon the idea that we are in a very different kind of historical circumstance today with the degree of power being exercised mm -hmm. by uh, the woke left, by a state that is now not, you know, not even just neutral, but is rather hostile to all the traditional foundations of the United States and of the West, uh, that this really requires us to take on, you know, sort of a new posture towards, uh, in some cases, government power, but in other cases, even towards, uh, you know, institutions which otherwise conservatives might want to defer to. I mean, conservatives don't like the idea of dynamiting our institutions. But when you have higher education, when you have the prestige media that have been so thoroughly captured by a very hostile and very aggressive left-wing ideology, you start to think you really do have to bypass these institutions or bring them down. Well, I agree with that. <laughs> uh, but when you talk about all these different viewpoints represented, at some point you have to have something beyond merely opposition to what I would consider a terrible left in this country. Uh, at some point, you got to have a policy or a candidate or something. Do you think the viewpoints are too diverse? Is this solvable? Well, there was, in fact, a uh, National Conservatism Manifesto that's been drawn up. And uh, you can find that at uh, you know, uh, the, the website for National Conservatism. And uh, it was published in both the American Conservative and also an unrelated publication in Europe called the European Conservative. And the manifesto, you know, in many respects, it's calling for an America which is not simply turning back the clock to, uh, you know, sort of the late 19th or early 20th century, but that is recovering the uh, idea that you do not have to have this really aggressive, um, you know, sort of secular state trying to override the uh, tendencies of the American people within their own, you know, sort of states and localities and neighborhoods to follow the way of life that they think is appropriate to themselves. So in other words, you know, we have a state which wants to tear down uh, any crosses that have been put up as World War I memorials on public grounds and things like that. And uh, this is something that national conservatives are very strongly opposed to. And instead, what they say is actually where you have a majority of the people or a, a you know, a local community, a neighborhood that has a particular set of, of dispositions in religion or in culture, that those dispositions should be allowed to uh, flourish and be allowed to show through. And this doesn't mean, you know, having the state impose, you know, a religious view or a cultural view upon uh, some set of people. In fact, I mean, it would be absurd to propose that uh, when you have someone like Yoram Hazoni, who himself is an Orthodox Jew, you know, talking to a Christian audience. He's not asking for persecution or, you know, some sort of strong arm tactics to be employed against himself and his own people. No, what it is about instead is recognizing that trying to remold people the way the left is doing is wrong. And letting people actually, you know, live in local communities according to the culture that's already there is the right and proper thing to do. And you need to respect minorities, of course, but you can do that while still respecting the majority as well. Interesting. Um, in, in your talk at our Scholars Conference a couple weeks back now, you mentioned that there's not much of a constituency, it seems, at the moment for what we would consider the Beltway version of libertarianism. Give us your thoughts on the state of libertarianism in the United States 2022. Yeah, you know, the establishment libertarian movement has really painted itself into a corner. And it's, it's shocking to see how much, uh, you know, momentum they have lost over the last four or five years. Uh, the Donald Trump era presented a challenge basically to uh, thinkers all across the political spectrum. You had to, you know, not fall for Trump derangement syndrome. You had mm -hmm. to, you know, stick to your principles and also show basically, as I think, uh, you know, the more effective libertarians did, uh, and they're a very small number, but you had to show that Donald Trump was tapping into something more fundamental than Trump himself. And I think the problem with a lot of establishment libertarians is they looked at Trump, they looked at Donald Trump's supporters, and they said, well, we just don't like these people, and therefore we're going to totally ignore the lessons that Trump and the Trump phenomenon are trying to teach us. Those lessons, of course, are that the you know, sort of dominant left liberal institutions of our era have totally lost their legitimacy, that uh, while the American middle class still wants to you know, have a way of life with all of the sort of uh, protections of the welfare state and you know, social security and whatnot that they're accustomed to, that they nonetheless you know, do not trust the you know, elite, the leadership class in our government, whether that means Hillary Clinton or whether it means 
uh, the FBI and uh, the administrative state. Donald Trump was a sign that Americans are willing to be quite radical in uh, taking on these, uh, you know, kind of uh, pillars of the real, you know, operational government. It's often called the deep state. And you would think that libertarians of all kinds would look at, you know, sort of the uh, uh, malpractices of the FBI, some of the, you know, uh, attempts of the FBI, attempts of the, you know, State Department, Defense Department, and other departments to go around Donald Trump because they didn't like the policies of the elected leader of the executive branch. So you actually had officials who were basically saying, well, we're just not going to implement Donald Trump's policy of getting out of Syria or of getting out of Iraq. We're just going to go around the presidential, you know, directives that come from the elected head of the executive branch. And we're basically going to conduct our own foreign policy, our own state policy, as if we unelected officials are the real powers in this country. You would think that any libertarian would look at that and say, this is the worst thing that is, you know, this, this is just the, the, the pulling the veil off and revealing exactly how the state actually operates, that it's not this constitutional thing. It's in fact something that is trying to overcome and subvert the constitution. And uh, I think, unfortunately, I mean, and I'll just name a name here, but I think someone like Justin Amash really, uh, you know, was so shocked and, you know, sort of polarized by Donald Trump that he failed to look at, you know, the much bigger problem of the deep state. And so he was willing to go along with some of the attacks on Donald Trump that were being leveled by uh, deep state, uh, you know, advocates. And I think the, the establishment libertarian movement as a whole, you know, had the same problem. Then you had COVID, where, again, you would think that if anyone was going to speak up for American civil liberties, for the right to, you know, um, gather with your friends without masks, that libertarians would be the ones to stand up for this. Uh, but shockingly, a lot of Beltway uh, DC uh, you know, libertarian institutions, uh, they either didn't do it or they did it in such a cowardly and sort of quiet way that they wound up uh, losing a lot of credibility. And I was surprised that even a lot of, uh, you know, libertarians I talked to who are on the edges of the establishment, who are not, you know, all that radical, are nonetheless so deeply disappointed in what they saw from some of the Beltway institutions during COVID uh, that they're willing now to write them off. And uh, then within the Libertarian Party, which has always been, you know, a rather um, colorful sideline to mainstream politics, one might say, um, you know, you had this kind of uh, left liberal mush, uh, you know, this kind of low tax liberalism as the ideology of the Libertarian Party. And uh, that, too, uh, you know, came under fire and has been now thrown out by a lot of grassroots libertarians who wanted, you know, uh, to take on both some, you know, to, to be a little more outspoken culturally, to speak up in favor of you know, sort of free speech and cultural freedom against political correctness and wokeness. And you also perhaps want to take a harder line uh, against uh, COVID crackdowns and things like that. So uh, I think libertarianism as a whole is undergoing a shakeup now, but there's still a lot of uh, libertarian foundation money, which wants to kind of, you know, turn back the clock to where things stood in maybe 2015 or for that matter in 2005. And uh, I just don't see that as being a successful thing to do. But again, when there's that much money behind it, um, they can at least, uh, you know, um, prop up a few, you know, institutions and a few scholars to go out there and try to, you know, promulgate this kind of middle of the road uh, libertarianism, which I think is, um, you know, it's just not what the public wants. Well, Daniel, if there's a schism between schism between, you know, the National Review Never Trumper types and the the uh, Claire Monsters, Claire Monistas today, I think we also see that within libertarian circles, right? In other words, there's a there's sort of two libertarianisms, one of which I would argue is very much rooted in the 20th century. Uh, it approaches uh, almost self-actualization, liberation theology. It's all about the self and the individual, and it's rooted in things like civil rights and egalitarianism and freedom of movement and open borders and these kinds of things, which I guess we could define as Beltway or Justin Amash libertarianism. And then there's one that's more rooted in 19th century liberalism, the older Misesian view, which is rooted in property and sovereignty and self-determination. Um, so, you know, may, whether Trump caused this or exposed this, whether COVID caused this or exposed this, it seems like we have these two irreconcilable libertarianisms. I think that's right. You know, uh, the, the one kind of libertarianism, uh, which I think you've characterized as more the 20th century variety, is um, very comfortable with the world as it is and the direction in which it's going. And uh, this is a kind of libertarianism which thinks that, you know, things are always getting better and better uh, because now, you know, in the ex example given by uh, one libertarian, uh, you know, because now a hotel clerk won't look, you know, twice if you check into a hotel room with, you know, any combination of people of different sexes or of, you know, uh, different uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, 
different identities that they might be projecting. And uh, this, for a certain kind of libertarianism, uh, this is uh, exactly what we're meant to be moving towards. Uh, this is mission accomplished for them. Whereas I think, uh, you know, more Rothbardian libertarians, they look at the way the world is going and they say, this is actually really a mess. Um, you know, they, they look at this, these cultural changes and they say, well, you know, we don't have to approve of this. We actually, some of us have some reservations about this. And it may not be something that we think that the state has to get involved in. But uh, mm -hmm. nonetheless, the fact that the state actually is actively promoting a certain, you know, kind of uh, identity politics, um, this is a big problem for us. So uh, there's that uh, issue. And then also, you know, I think the more Rothbardian kind of libertarianism uh, looks at foreign policy, looks at the fact that, you know, nuclear war is now being talked about in a way that is not just, you know, hypothetical, but is actually, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, in prospect, that there is serious discussion of tactical nukes and of nuclear exchanges between uh, the major powers. This is a massive deterioration of the security environment. Uh, this is a, a very dangerous development. And of course, Rothbardian libertarians also look at the monetary system. They look at what the Fed is doing. They look at, you know, the inflation that we're suffering right now. And they say, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is much worse to come here if we don't take a really radical course correction very soon. Uh, whereas I think the, you know, the 20th century libertarians, as we're describing them, um, they, uh, they have a they're, in the short run, they're, they're certainly more worried about the cultural right. They're more worried about the folks gathering and talking at the National Conservatism Conference than they are about, you know, the FBI, um, you know, going to excesses than they are about, uh, you know, the prospect of World War III or than they are about uh, the monetary system. So uh, that sense of, you know, whether or not this is an urgent moment and whether, you know, the general trends of uh, civilization over the last 200 years have been towards liberty I think those are some of the key dividing lines. Well, and this is, of course, a, a critique of my own, which is I think dopey libertarians can't even admit or acknowledge that currently it's on the right where people are saying we should never have been in Afghanistan. It's on the right where people are saying we ought to get rid of the FBI and the CIA. It's on the right today where people are saying don't send your kid to the woke military. I mean, these are pretty astonishing changes from the George W. Bush neocon era of the 2000s, where people like Lou Rockwell and Ron Paul uh, and Pat Buchanan were being called unpatriotic conservatives. So I think that's a shift that libertarians are too dopey to admit because they're so uh, ensconced in their, I'm neither left nor right world, uh, for one. But I, I guess here's the question. If we view libertarianism as coming out of liberalism, coming out of enlightenment thought, uh, you know, Rothbard struggled, I think, towards the end of his career to, at least in the U.S. context, to put libertarianism on the right. Is that a pretty tough task? Does libertarianism, in, in Daniel McCarthy's view, properly reside on the left? No, libertarianism is not simply on the left. And I think Rothbard, uh, you know, uh, towards the end of his life, he pointed us towards a number of really interesting research areas which need to be picked up on by um, subsequent scholars. So Rothbard became increasingly interested in things like the School of Salamanca, for example, which was a Catholic school of economic thought that preceded um, Adam Smith. And it was actually, you know, uh, even more free market in principle than Smith was. Uh, and for that matter, if you look back into the Middle Ages, you will see many of the key developments upon which liberties are based. Many of the, you know, sort of deepest understandings of human dignity and human rights actually derive from a medieval order rather than having been dis, uh, discovered by the Enlightenment uh, you know, in the 17th or 18th centuries. So in that sense, there are much deeper roots of our liberties and therefore of libertarianism properly understood than the usual Enlightenment myth would lead us to believe. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, um, you know, I've recently written the, uh, in the foreword to a new edition of a book called uh, The Conservative Affirmation by, uh, by Wilmore Pendle. And uh, he has this chapter in the book where he talks about the essential difference between conservatism and modern liberalism, or the essential difference between left and right in the American context. And even though Kendall is a figure who's very different from uh, libertarians and who you know, libertarians might initially have some disagreements with, his formula for how to understand conservatism is actually very helpful here, because he says that conservatism in America fundamentally is the rejection of the left-wing revolution that has been uh, you know, sort of uh, in motion since about the middle of the 20th century or perhaps the early 20th century. And uh, understood in that light, you can see why um, the, a lot of libertarians are in fact on the right, uh, 
a lot of libertarians or perhaps even be conservatives by Kendall's definition, because they are opposed to this kind of massive administrative state, security state, welfare warfare state, which is leading the revolution towards you know, transforming America from a constitutional republic into uh, this kind of administrative empire. So in that sense, um, you know, I think many libertarians are conservatives or are on the right, uh, even if that's not a label they would apply to themselves. Uh, but the other useful thing about Kendall's schematic is that it shows that you can also have libertarians who might be on the left or who are you know, sort of uh, modern liberals in that they are on the side of the revolution. And I think that's true of a lot of the establishment libertarians who, again, don't seem to be as alarm, al alarmed by the administrative state, by the national security state, by the welfare warfare state, as uh, you know, they're willing to just, they have this very optimistic view that if we just ignore these massive aggregations of state power that are destroying sort of local communities and neighborhoods and are even trying to transform individual identities, even in the case of children now, individual sexes, uh, the state is promoting all of this stuff. And yet uh, a lot of uh, Beltway libertarians, they have this complacent view that if we just ignore that and instead focus on growing GDP or, you know, uh, you know, uh, the ability of uh, more people to engage in hair braiding without getting a license, that this is going to be such a wonderful, uh, productive thing. It's going to make so much prosperity that all of this, you know, growth of state power can just be ignored because it will ultimately be dwarfed by the prosperity of the private sphere. Whereas in fact, what the state's doing is both going to very much jeopardize our private prosperity as we already see right now, but it's also going to fundamentally um, instill uh, not just sort of bad habits uh, in terms of the identity politics that it's promoting, but it's ultimately going to even destroy people psychologically internally. And you see that right now, that there's an enormous, you know, sort of epidemic of mental illness in this country. You see teenagers who are depressed and suicidal. You see our life expectancy in this country is declining, largely mm -hmm. because of self-inflicted uh, forms of harm, uh, whether that's suicide or whether it's, um, you know, sort of uh, abuse of opioids, which is leading people to have overdoses and die. Uh, these things are brought about by the psychological conditions that the you know, sort of modern liberal state establishment has been promoting, both through state power itself and also through all the private institutions that basically do the bidding of the state. Well, when it comes to outreach or maybe a new fusionism with the right, maybe one thing libertarians like me, doctrinaire, tedious, and cap types, uh, need to say things like we were wrong about corporations. I think that's right. You know, uh, again, referring to the uh, sort of 20th century model, most uh, libertarians have looked at the Soviet Union as being the archetype of the enemy. And communism has been the antithetical ideology that libertarians have been most worried about. And quite rightly, a lot of libertarians, when they see modern liberals uh, on the left uh, talking about fascism, they realize, okay, well, the fascism is just being used as a, you know, uh, a generic description of anyone that is winning an argument against a modern liberal. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, one of the, you know, sort of insidious things about actual fascism and actual Nazism was that it involved using the state to bully and corral and corrupt, uh, you know, private institutions into doing the bidding of a very radical evil ideology. And what we see right now, I mean, it's always, you know, it sounds inflammatory and it sounds hysterical to draw parallels between what happened in uh, fascist states in the early 20th century and what's happening now. But there is this parallel where private institutions have been corrupted. They've been told, OK, here is a comprehensive ideology that you as an institution must adopt. And there are certain legal um, incentives to adopt this ideology. In some cases, there are direct commands from the federal bureaucracy. Uh, through you know, various provisions of the Civil Rights Act, like Title IX and so forth. Uh, in part, it is simply a matter of, hey, if you want to do business with us, you have to adopt uh, the same ideology that we have as state contractors and whatnot. And also there is this idea of prestige, that if you want to have the prestige of being associated with the state, of being the kind of person who can be put in charge of a department or an agency, um, or who, even uh, someone who wants to you know, go to a dinner party with these folks or a cocktail party, you have to adopt the ideology. And so we see uh, a lot of private and semi-private institutions, things like the educational establishment, uh, higher education in particular, they adopt these ideas or they generate these ideas in the first place and they kind of win a, uh, you know, a, um, a, a place of respect among uh, the governing class. And this is, this is the real power structure we're up against. It is not just the state you know, by itself, but it's rather a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, 
a rather complex octopus-like entity um, that uh, combines the state with a number of private institutions. And the left is able to use each of these institutions for what it is most efficient at doing. So in other words, um, you know, the federal government still has some restrictions placed upon it by the division of powers, by the Bill of Rights, by the First Amendment. But private institutions like Facebook and Twitter and the social media and the uh, prestige media, they're not bound by any of that. So they can uh, squelch uh, conversation in ways that the federal government cannot. And when you have these two powers working together, the coercive power of the state and the rather more unlimited but non-coercive power of private institutions, when you put these two things together, you get a totally comprehensive power that is both as coercive as the state, but is also unbounded in the way that private institutions are supposed to be. And this poses a threat that I think libertarians and conservatives both have to recognize, and they have to really work through how to unwind this problem uh, without jettisoning you know, their deepest principles. Uh, you know, sometimes you see, I think, um, and this is one of the tendencies of national conservatives or what's called the new right that I think has to be um, uh, proceed with very carefully, if not, you know, sort of criticized and rejected. And that is, you know, the idea that maybe you could simply create a kind of counter Leviathan or have a, you know, a right wing state that is as powerful as the left wing state and that you could reverse some of these cultural changes if you had a kind of right wing state power. But um, I think if you look closely at the way in which the left has conducted its operations and seized control of our institutions and uses state power, but not just state power, you'll find that it's a very difficult strategy to replicate on the right. That there's an asymmetry here because the right is fundamentally about people being able to govern themselves and lead their own lives within their own communities, with their own families. And there certainly are larger institutions, churches and other things that uh, conservatives want to be engaged in. But an institution like the Catholic Church, you know, really understands the importance of um, uh, subsidiarity, the importance of, you know, uh, every individual Christian, every family, all of these are meant to be units that are able to take care of themselves to the maximum extent possible. And you only bring in higher levels of organization as is necessary. Uh, the left is really not about that at all. What the left mm -hmm. wants to do is to destroy and atomize at the more local uh, molecular granular levels. Uh, in order to create an undifferentiated mass, even sexually undifferentiated mass, which can then be therapeutically manipulated and controlled by this overarching tutelary power. I think it actually resembles uh, in a great uh, you know, a deal of detail the kind of dystopian vision that one finds if you look closely at uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. People think of Democracy in America as this book that's very optimistic about America and that presents all of these you know, sort of fine ideas about how nice American democracy is. But Tocqueville is actually quite uh, gloomy and pessimistic and prophetic. And he talks about how ultimately American democracy might destroy itself. It might be overcome by this centralized, immense tutelary power, which would then centralize all power, uh, eradicate the sort of local springs of virtue and of ordered liberty that Tocqueville thought were so valuable, eradicate them and replace them instead with uh, you know, this kind of um, secular god upon earth, uh, this all powerful state. And that's exactly what we see happening. This all-powerful state, of course, is not just the official state, as you know, any libertarian would recognize it, but is rather the state in combination with a lot of private entities, which are able to do some things that the uh, state itself can't do. The other thing that's worth mentioning here, just in brief, is that the, the one good thing you can say about socialism and even about communism, because these were systems of complete statism, they were also systems that were very, very inefficient very, very ineffective, even at doing the evil things that they wanted to do, for the most part. There are some things that socialism is able to do very effectively as an evil institution, but for the most part, socialism couldn't pr deliver any of its promises. Communism couldn't deliver any of its promises. The whole thing was so you know, state-run and inefficient and bureaucratic that it was all you know, primed to collapse. Whereas what you have now with what the left is doing, when you have the state, but you also have some degree of private um, uh, entities that are corrupted and brought into play, those private entities are much more efficient and effective than old, you know, sort of Soviet style or uh, socialist style state institutions were. So I think, you know, there's this real need for a new kind of, um, you know, you don't just need to refer to F.A. Hayek and the road to serfdom. There's a need for a new book that actually looks at the real relationship between ideology, state power and private elite institutions and sees, you know, the big picture there. Uh, and those libertarians who are still kind of stuck on looking at the model that one finds in Hayek. Um, they really need to update their thinking because right now we're up against a very, a very much more complex kind of foe that um, you know is having tremendous uh, ill effects on our lives. Uh, you know everything from street crime to you know involving us in endless wars, uh, 
to you know prompting Americans to be so psychologically damaged that they're turning to suicide or to drug overdoses. Mm-hmm. Well, and there is a caricature, a Lulbert stereotype, which is that libertarians have to say, well, what do you care about trans if young people are chopping off body parts? That's none of your business. And, and so I understand that. I also think there are people on the right who understand that that's not all libertarians. That's fine. Um, I, I very much question the idea that the right could capture the federal state, especially the deep state in any meaningful way. But when we consider the alternative, subsidiarity, as, a, as an approach, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have been a critic of the idea of national divorce or secession movements, at least in a, in a general theoretical plane. That's right. You know, I tend to be more of a uh, Madisonian federalist. So I think it's important that you have very strong local communities and states, which then, you know, should select uh, real honest representatives of the local culture and community to go to Washington, D.C. And then in Washington, D.C., you can have an aggregated federal government that is actually federal and not just a kind of centralized, monolithic, left liberal government. And that uh, that aggregation of uh, state and local views should produce a, you know, sort of uh, a limited but uh, but more wise uh, and uh, you know sort of uh, effective kind of limited uh, federal power. The problem with national divorce, I think, it's it's a couple of things. Uh, one of them is that it seems like there are very few regions of the United States right now that are not already uh, infected by the virus of uh, you know this uh, modern left. Um, so, for example, a lot of red states are really dependent upon the blue cities within them for a lot of their economic prosperity. And so the idea that the state would be separated from the uh, United States wouldn't necessarily solve the problem because you would still have the difference between uh, the surrounding, you know, sort of red countryside and the blue cities within the states. If you take the take it further down to a divorce, you know, not just at the national level, but at the state and local level, you're still going to have a lot of these cultural and economic connections, even between units that are now seen as being more politically uh, autonomous. And that's going to start to unwind things. I also just have some views, you know, sort of based upon uh, the way in which uh, the Greek city states and later on in the, uh, uh, you know, sort of late uh, medieval and uh, early modern uh, Renaissance periods, the way the Italian city states all sort of worked out. I think there are some serious security problems that start to arise when you have uh, small states that have, uh, you know, a variety of conflicts with one another and are also interdependent on one another, but don't really have a way of coordinating their, their relationships but coordinating them in such a way that um, that they don't overbalance. So, I mean, the problem you get with something like uh, the city-state of Athens being, you know, an independent city-state with a coalition of allies in Greece uh, during, uh, uh, you know, the Peloponnesian War, for example, you get a, a city-state where you don't have, you know, what we have today in terms of federalism or a federal government. There was no pan-Hellenic Greek government, but the city-state of Athens was so powerful among its, uh, you know, allies uh, in other cities that it wound up basically dominating them in an imperialistic way. And I think actually, if ancient Greece had had federalism along our lines, rather than having mm. uh, what seemed to be a more decentralized system, but in fact actually wound up being a more hegemonic system with Athens, that that would have been much better for Greece, or at least better for the Delian League. So these are getting into some you know sort of deep historical details, uh, but those are some of the reasons why I'm skeptical of the idea of national divorce. And I tend to favor something along the lines of a a true federalism as our founders intended. Well, Daniel, at this point, I would definitely take some aggressive federalism. Uh, Living as I do down here in pretty red Alabama. But as you point out, we have deep blue cities. We have Birmingham and Montgomery right here. So I understand these dilemmas. But being an ecumenical guy, uh, final question, I'll put you on the spot. for, for my audience, our audience, the Mises Institute, a, an audience interested in Austrianism and largely but not entirely ANCAP, is, is there one book you could recommend from Daniel McCarthy's worldview that you think would benefit them? Well, it will indeed uh, be the book for which I've just written the foreword. There you uh, go. Wilmer Pendle's uh, The Conservative Affirmation. Uh, it's, it's one of the most, I think, challenging books, especially for a libertarian to pick up because you'll find in here that Kendall is attacking the principle of free speech. He's attacking John Stuart Mill. He's talking about uh, something that sounds an awful lot like majoritarian democracy in some places. And so the initial impression, not just that a libertarian would get, but even a lot of ordinary sort of garden variety conservatives would get from Wilmore Kendall, is that this guy is really a radical Democrat who's saying a lot of things that are totally antithetical to liberty, 
totally antithetical to the idea that you need to have wise government, a kind of, you know, uh, natural aristocracy as opposed to a democracy. But actually, I think if you if you read the book, you know, maybe twice and not just once, what you'll realize is that actually uh, Kendall is describing how at the local level you do, in fact, have uh, or should be able to get the kind of natural aristocracy and wise, you know, sort of leadership of a consensual public that is actually the kind of thing that our founding fathers were hoping for and the kind of thing that probably is the best form of, uh, you know, sort of practical government uh, that exists uh, or can ever exist within the world. And beyond that, you know, an AMCAP would be looking for, uh, you know, uh, deriving an entirely voluntaristic and entirely private property based uh, order. But I think you'll find that a lot of what Wilmore Kendall says, um, even perhaps even crosses over with some of Hans Hermann Hoppe's views. So Hoppe is currently being criticized very strongly for saying that basically, if you have private property, uh, you know, uh, a private property order, private property anarchism, then, um, you know, the people who have their own property or who have, um, you know, bring their property together in a kind of homeowners association on a large scale, that they would have a lot of uh, ability to select who they would want to include in their communities. And some of these, some of these you know, uh, property owners or some of these aggregates, they might uh, want to pursue the kind of uh, woke community building that you see on the modern left, uh, but some of them would not. Some of them would be very traditional kinds of communities that might not be inclusive in the way that today's modern left would demand. Well, Wilmore Kendall isn't as uh, radical as uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe in that regard, but he is indeed talking about the fact that ultimately um, you know, with whatever kind of association you're talking about, whether it's one in which people are private property owners, whether it's one in which it's a local government, but any kind of association, even if it's a, a private firm, is one that has to draw certain limits as to what its membership is and what it means to be a member. So, you know, think about how if, uh, you know, Hans Hoppe, Hermann Hoppe has talked about if you want to advocate communism, you know, you don't have a free speech right on someone else's property or in a, you know, sort of a, a collection of property owners who've come together and established a, you know, a, a community of property owners, you don't have a, a freestanding natural right to go into that place and start preaching communism and preaching the overthrow of that whole community and civilization. Uh, you don't have a right to go into someone's business and start, you know, just trashing the business and telling everyone to get out of the store and go shop, you know, down the road or, you know, um, expropriate the expropriators. And if you did that within any business, the businessman would have every right to throw you it out. Well, when, when Wilmore Kendall talks about Joe McCarthy, when he, when he talks about the limits of free speech, he's actually getting at the same issues that someone like Hoppe is talking about. Uh, Kendall's talking about them in the, in the context of America and local government and whatnot, uh, but it's the same fundamental question. You have to have some degree of consensus and some degree of limits if you're going to have any kind of community, whether it's private property, whether it's you know a, a well-designed American-style constitutional republic, or if it's going to be anything else. And of course, the left understands this very well. And what the left wants to do is simply create uh, speech codes for all of us at the national level. They would do it at the global level if they could. And, you know, they, they will certainly make every effort to try. So this is something that libertarians, you know, they'll have an, a, a, an initial reaction against uh, what they might see in a book like The Conservative Affirmation. But I think actually if they look closely, they'll see Kendall is, is drawing out some fundamental concerns here that libertarians as well as conservatives need to address and need to be willing to take seriously. Well, I am going to read it. Where can I find the book? Where can I purchase it? Well, it's uh, published by Regnery. Uh, it was just brought out in a new edition uh, earlier this month. It is. Uh, it was originally published in 1963, which might make it sound dated. Uh, JFK was still alive, and the Beatles had not yet played Ed Sullivan. But in fact, uh, Wilmore Kendall was so much ahead of his time that his book is more relevant now in the era of populist conservatism and the new right uh, than it was even in the 1960s when it was first published. And so uh, that's why I wrote a foreword trying to, you know, just uh, uh, show readers how prophetic Kendall had been and why he's uh, worth uh, rediscovering. So it's published by Regnery. Um, you'll be able to find it on Regnery's website or, uh, you know, if you want to uh, shop in the woke corporate world, uh, Amazon.com uh, has it as well. And Kendall, if I recall, only lived to maybe 55 or 60 years old. That's right. You know, he was quite a personally troubled individual, uh, uh, you know, especially with uh, uh, a lifelong uh, problem of alcoholism. Ah. And so he dies around uh, the age of 58 or so in uh, mm. 1968, uh, 1967, 68, around there. So mm. just a few years after he writes The Conservative Affirmation. He was brilliant, but very cantankerous. Um, so uh, there hasn't been quite as much of a school of thought around Kendall uh, 
as there is among you know figures like Leo Strauss, for example. But uh, actually, among those who have you know sort of read uh, Kendall closely, uh, he's won a lot of admirers. So someone like George Carey at Georgetown University uh, was a great longtime admirer of Wilmore Kendall, and George Carey, who was a friend of mine, um, was someone who came to very much appreciate. Uh, sort of uh, Rothbardian uh, libertarianism as well. So it was actually George Carey at Georgetown who recommended that uh, my organization, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, bring back into print uh, Justin Raimondo's uh, Reclaiming the Right, the great little history that uh, Justin Raimondo wrote in the early 90s of uh, the American right and conservatism. So uh, there are some interesting connections. Uh, also, uh, someone like uh, Emmy Bradford, for example, the great uh, Southern uh, historian and the great uh, critic of Harry Jaffa, uh, Emmy Bradford was also someone who found a great deal of inspiration in the work of Wilmore Kendall. So he's a figure who I think cuts across a lot of different ideological um, schools of thought. Kendall was also someone, you know, with um, uh, he personally admired Leo Strauss a great deal, and his book actually uh, derives a little bit from Straussian thought in many respects. And so, uh, you know, there are a lot of Straussians and other folks who uh, are oftentimes seen as being on the opposite end of the kind of uh, will, will, you know, sort of um, uh, Emmy Bradford spectrum of, you know, uh, the Lincoln question and things like that. Uh, but even a lot of Straussians find Wilmore Kendall to be invaluable. So he's he's really an idiosyncratic thinker, but a, a very brilliant and very important one for our own time. Well, Daniel, I want to thank you for your time. I want to encourage people to uh, follow Daniel on Twitter. It might be the best way, at Tory Anarchist, which is a, Men a Mencken term, I believe. But also keep up with ISI. And, and I really it, I encourage people to subscribe to Modern Age. Uh, it, it's really going to give you, I think, a, a more intellectual or erudite look at some of these things happening in the world today. So appreciate your time, Daniel. And ladies and gentlemen, you have a great weekend. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. And in the meantime, you can find more content like this at Mises.org.